Thanks to CuriosityStream for supporting my channel. Catch me on a very good trivia show when you sign up for CuriosityStream and Nebula using the link in the description. Today we are doing a tier list, specifically a tier list on different machine learning methods based on my personal experiences with them. So it'll be a little bit learning about machine learning and a little bit of story time of some of the research that I've done in the past. And before we go any further, I just want to say this is purely for entertainment's sake based on my personal experiences. If you use machine learning models, you will almost definitely disagree with how I classify some of these. And that's totally fine. I'd love to hear in the comments below where you would put that method instead and what kind of work you do with it as opposed to some of the angry personal insults that get caught by my very expensive comment filter. Cool. Cool. All right, so we're gonna be looking at 10 different methods today with five different categories. So each method can receive an A if I think it is great and I use it all the time and it has no flaws. A B if it's good to have in the toolbox but isn't necessarily the first thing I pick up. A C if I learned how to do it for a class but haven't really used it since. A D if it's very frustrating to use but is on occasion useful. And an F if something happened the first time I used it that caused me to never use it again. And with each ranking, I'll be briefly explaining the method itself as well as why I chose it for that category. And again, I'd love to hear how you guys would rank these methods yourselves and how you've used them in your work, so drop a comment below. All right, so we're going to start with feature engineering and pre-processing, which we're going to drag over to our first A. So I use feature engineering all the time for a ton of different things. It's Something that I think is often a little bit underrated in machine learning, we see a lot of people just like throwing data at models and hoping that it will work out. And especially with some stuff that I'm working on currently for the PhD side of things, which as I mentioned in other videos, most of my work there is currently confidential. I will tell you guys about it as soon as I possibly can, but for now that's gonna have to stay under wraps. But for that work, I definitely found that my initial approach was to just like build a deep neural network and try to classify my data that way and I very quickly realized that this data if you pre-process it and transform it with some pretty basic stuff like principal component analysis is very easily separable and then you can just apply a linear model to it and call it a day so feature engineering and pre-processing definitely at the top of the list great thing use it all the time highly recommend doing more of it if it's something that you haven't looked into as much before because it turns out that if you create features that are actually more useful for your data then you can often develop better and simpler models all right so next up we have linear models which i'm going to put here so I'm giving linear models a B because I don't actually use them that much at the end of the day. I find that most of my work is a little bit too complex for a linear model to handle it besides that project that I mentioned that I'm working on right now. But I do think that they're something that you should probably look at first when you're developing machine learning models for different applications, uh, especially if you're able to feature engineer your way down to a complexity that a linear model can handle because linear models are often actually quite powerful even if we don't think so up front because we hear all this stuff about deep learning and at the end of the day when it comes to making something that's interpretable it's also a lot easier to interpret things like linear models than it is to interpret these complex deep neural networks all right next thing and this one might be a little bit controversial based on people who've watched my channel before but we'll see what you guys think I'm giving neural networks a C. This is because, as I mentioned, so Cs are things that I might have learned for a class and don't really use that much. And honestly, like simple neural networks are definitely one of those things that I learned for a class and don't really use that much past it. I find that one category that I didn't include here is kernel methods, and kernel methods would probably also go with linear models. But in short, I haven't encountered many problems that I'm trying to solve using machine learning where, where a simple neural network performs better than some sort of kernel method on a support vector machine or otherwise linear classifier. So as a quick aside, kernel methods are essentially where you transform the data. So you map the data from your original equation X to some other equation that is made up of X. And the reason why we use kernel methods is because something that might be not linearly separable, so not completely separable in one plane, when you transform it using a kernel method, can become separable. So I can show you an example of it here. It also lets you add more information to your model on certain levels. So what your kernel is can depend on what you think your data's distribution is. If you think your data has a Gaussian distribution, you can make it a Gaussian kernel. 
And I find that that's just a lot more useful for tailoring models to what I'm trying to do than a simple neural network is, which just kind of finds patterns based on the data that you give it. And that's especially true when we get to our next method, which is deep learning. So I'm being pretty general here when I say deep learning, I'm mostly referring to deep neural networks. And we're going to give deep learning a B. And that's because unlike simple neural networks, deep learning is actually really useful if you have really complex high dimensional data sets. I've definitely used it for some problems that I've encountered in my own neural data. And it's more helpful than simple models because you just can encode way more information and it can handle noisy data and you don't have to worry as much about that. And for data that you maybe can't feature engineer your way out of or can't use kernel methods to get out of, Deep learning is probably the next step I would take over building a simple neural network. All right, next up, and this might be surprising for people who uh, have watched my earlier videos about some of the work that I've worked on in the past, which we'll get into in a sec, but next up is encryption, which is going to be our first F. So as a reminder, F is the category of things where I tried it once and had such a bad experience with it that I never use it again. Uh, and I would say that encryption is probably the only thing, and this is kind of privacy preserving machine learning broadly, uh, it's, it's really the only method that I've had one experience with and have just no interest in going back. And that didn't say that it's important and that people shouldn't be working on it. I absolutely think it's important. I think it's a really interesting field that's definitely growing right now and that it will have huge implications on data privacy and machine learning going forward. Having said that, encryption is so mathy. <laughs> And I'm just not a deeply mathy person. Like math theory, when it comes to learning machine learning or any sort of engineering topic, math theory is definitely the thing that I am worst at. And like, you can see it in my grades. I, I do really well in applied topics and I can break down the math, especially for things like these videos when I need to, but encryption relies on so much like proof theory and real analysis that just like goes way over my head and it's so confusing. So the one time that I did it for a rotation, I was working on something called split neural networks, which I can include a reference to in the description. Um, but essentially the idea is that you want to train one part of your network locally on some other device and train the other part of your network on some sort of cloud server. And so the information that in my case is HIPAA protected, so medical images, doesn't actually leave your phone. So you're still protecting the data, but you're also still extracting that information that you need through that first half of the neural network. And so when we were working on that, we were interested in both the federated learning side of things, so model privacy, building privacy into your model, but we were also interested in how you can encrypt the data in ways that allow you to still bring that important information out. And I tried for like three months to learn and understand what I was doing, which was kind of the more important part, um, how the encryption worked and what it did to the data and whether that meant that I could get more information out of it and it just it went so over my head. So something that I'm definitely interested in continuing to follow but probably from afar. All right next up is generative models which is going to be our first D and so this might actually be interesting for any of you who are coming over from the Tom Scott video that I just did on deepfakes uh, because I spent a lot of time working on generative models for that. But as a reminder, the D category is for things that I find difficult to work with, but can be useful in specific scenarios. And generative models are really that for me. So I don't have use for generative models most of the time. They're just not something that are particularly useful in my line of work. And when I do use them, they can just be a little bit unwieldy to get going, get fine tuned to what exactly you want them to do. Um, they tend to take a pretty long time to train. So it's not that I don't like them. I think that they are really interesting. I think that they have a lot of really interesting uses. Uh, but for the stuff that I do, I just, they're not particularly useful to me. All right, next up, we have reinforcement learning, which will be our next B. So I think reinforcement learning is super cool. <laughs> Reinforcement learning was definitely one of those things that I learned about originally in a class and it's one of the few things that like you see in like a math class that you're taking and you're like that's really cool. So I, I, I think the math behind it is really interesting. I think that the models that you can make with it is really interesting. I just think it's a really interesting topic. Uh, it's also useful for my research. Some of the stuff that I do has to do with control theory and so 
reinforcement learning uh, can be used for control theory problems. Uh, and so it's, it's definitely useful there. I only don't put it in the A category because it's just not something that I use a ton. It's not usually useful for the types of problems that I'm trying to work with, which tend to be more on the like data classification side of things. But it's just such a fascinating set of methods and it's something that I really hope to work with more in the future. Okay, we're down to our last three. So next up is going to be genetic algorithms, which go in the D part. And again, if you saw the collab that I did with Simon Clark, where he used genetic algorithms to create a model that could play Warhammer against him, don't have anything against genetic algorithms, I think they're great. So genetic algorithms work by essentially choosing some random initialization of models, testing them, choosing the top performing, you know, 10, 20%, whatever you want to do, and then essentially breeding new models out of those based on those optimal parameters and changing the parameters in ways that you think will help you get closer to the actual best model. For the work that I do, they're not usually super useful, although I am going to be using it for some brain simulation optimization coming up soon. But yeah, they're just not something that I use all that much. But we'll see how it works for this project that I'm doing coming up, so potentially genetic algorithms might move up a spot. Second to last, we have unsupervised learning. So unsupervised learning is going to go into the C slot. And this is because it is mostly something that I learned in a class and then since then only really touch when it comes to feature engineering. So if we're considering methods of dimensionality reduction, things like principal component analysis to be a form of unsupervised learning, then I use it in that capacity. But when it comes to like clustering algorithms, otherwise things like k-means, that's just not something that I use very often. It's not usually that relevant to my data. Um, so again, nothing against it, it's just not something I use a ton. And then last but not least, my favorite machine learning technique known as not using machine learning in the first place. This kind of circles back to the video that I did on making AI fair. And I think that there's definitely a lot of cases where people either in my lab or outside of it will ask me questions about, oh, how could we use machine learning on like this kind of data? And a lot of the time, my answer is that machine learning probably isn't the best way to do it. There are other statistical methods that might be a lot more useful for whatever it is you're doing. And so I think that for me at least, kind of exploring the data itself and, and getting a feel for the different ways that I can represent it and other ways that I might be able to get the information that I want out of it without necessarily using machine learning is often where I start these types of problems before deciding on whether or not machine learning is actually the best approach to doing it versus something else. So that's all the methods that I'm gonna rank today. Again, leave a comment below with where you would rank things. I guess I can actually put a link to this in the description too, cause it's like a public template. So if you wanna like share your rankings with me on Twitter and Instagram, you can do that. And if there are other things in machine learning or artificial intelligence that you'd like to see me rank other categories of things, definitely let me know in the description because this was a lot of fun and I'd love to do it again. Now, it was really fun to come up with this machine learning tier list game, but what you might not know is that when it comes to other kinds of games like trivia, I am very bad. Fortunately, I am very good at drawing circles for $500. In fact, you can see that for yourself by watching one of our newest Nebula Originals, a very good trivia show where myself, Brian McManus from Real Engineering, and Dave Amos from City Beautiful compete in a series of funny and strange challenges arranged by Sam from Wendover. If you're new to my channel, Nebula is a creator-built platform where you get to watch my videos ad-free and we can create and experiment with awesome content without having to worry about demonetization or paying tribute to the YouTube algorithm. We're thrilled to be partnering with CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service with thousands of documentaries and nonfiction videos. In fact, if for some reason you're feeling nostalgic about 2020, you can check out their new documentary on the best science stories of 2020. And where CuriosityStream is all about big budget nonfiction documentaries, we're building Nebula so that education creators have a place to make content that might not work as well on YouTube. On Nebula, you'll find ad-free videos from some of your favorite creators, from TierZoo to Neurotransmissions to The Coding Train. 
You can also find my Nebula Journal Clubs or watch Questionable Advice, another Nebula original where Vanessa Hill from Braincraft tries to help me order less takeout. You can get access to Curiosity Stream at their special holiday rate of 41% off their annual plan, with Nebula included for free as long as you are a Curiosity Stream member. That's less than $12 a year. Signing up for Curiosity Stream and Nebula is a great way to directly support my channel while getting to watch my videos ad-free, so sign up for Curiosity Stream and Nebula using the promo code Jordan or at curiositystream.com slash Jordan. Otherwise, if you like this video, you can let me know by smashing the like button and subscribing to my channel. If you're looking for more fun videos, you can also check out the time that I made a recipe that was generated by GPT-2 and it came out well, just watch the video, you'll see. Otherwise, if you'd like to follow my PhD life, you could do so on Twitter and Instagram, and I will see y'all on Monday.